Once again, I'm Wendy Mitchell from Screen International. Um, really glad you're here because we're going to see some amazing stuff from Phil mm -hmm. McNally of DreamWorks Animation, aka Captain 3D. Do you call yourself that? Oh, of course. Okay. Yes. Every morning. Yeah. <laughs> you are Captain 3D. Uh, yes, great. <laughs> um, and we're going to have a discussion and we're going to have a chance for you to ask Phil some questions as well, which I think is a great opportunity. And we're going to see some world premiere footage as we well. Are from so. Turbo. Actually, I've got a You're very lucky. ton of clips, so the less talking you want and the more pictures you want, we can do that. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, Phil, if you want to just kick off and... Sure. So, um, yes, my name's Phil McNally and I am the uh, head of stereo at DreamWorks Animation. So, um, basically anything after Monsters vs. Aliens, which has come out in 3D, has been my responsibility. And because it's DreamWorks Animation, I like to kick off with some World War II pictures. <laughs> so. Guys in the booth, um, let's play the World War II clip. Uh, it's flat, not scope. We're going to be changing around okay. a little bit. Let me get out of the way. So the reason I'm putting this up, I'll talk over this, is because this was my first experience with 3D. And um, I was 13 years old, and uh, my friend brought in this 3D viewer into school. And I was looking at these black and white pictures, because someone else had the viewer, and you know, disregarding them as just being, oh, it's just old pictures from the war. Because when you see them in 2D, it's just old pictures. But what amazed me is when I got my chance to actually look with the viewer, and you actually see them in 3D, these weren't old pictures anymore. This was like time travel, even though it was in black and white. But the idea that I was suddenly identifying with these people as individuals in a situation and not just like ancient history. I'll just let you look at them. And I didn't really know what stereo photography was at that time. And it was many years later when I was um, in college, actually at Royal College of Art studying furniture, <laughs> that we did a holography course just for one day and were introduced to the idea of stereo photography. And I realized that all this was was a picture taken from each eye's point of view. And when I realized that uh, that's what you could do, I went out and started to take a few pictures and then uh, discovered the Stereoscopic Society. And I know there's a, a few of us uh, in the room here today. Dave Berder, Andrew, I can see you sitting there. And so I really learned a lot of my stereo from the rules of the Stereoscopic Society and stereo photography and learning about you know, mounting slides to the window and all that type of stuff. Thanks, guys. And so it was always the kind of the fringe hobby, yeah. which you know, I'd dig out at the weekend and annoy my fr friends with another 3D ordeal, they used to call it. <laughs> um, I went to the US actually as an animator. And Chicken Little showed up when I was working at Industrial Light and Magic okay. from Disney. To, to be converted or re-rendered, mm. kind of. And it was really at that point I realized that you know, digital projection was going to allow for pretty amazing 3D content to be projected alongside you know, 2D or 3D. You know, mm. The projector could do them both. And so that was really the, um, and that's actually 2005 now. Mm -hmm. And Polar Express uh, probably kicked off this round of the 3D boom that we talk about, or you hear people talking mm -hmm. about it coming and going, but we're already almost 10 years into it, so <laughs> that's uh, pretty significant. Mm -hmm. So I think we jump ahead, right? So The Croods <laughs> is um, the DreamWorks animated movie, which was out last week in the US. I don't even know if it's out here at the moment, in a week or two, maybe. So uh, now I have to go into DreamWorks pitching mode. So here's our latest movie. <laughs> And uh, this is going to be playing in scope, guys, in the booth, just so you know. Um, the Croods is a family of uh, cave family, cavemen. You can't have a family of cavemen. <laughs> uh, and they have lived their life always hiding from the dangers of the outside world, because all their neighbors have already been killed. And so they really live in the cave until circumstances force them into other things. So really, what was significant about the Croods was um, we had all got several movies under our belt. Our head of layout, which is like our cinematographer, uh, Young Duck, who's uh, Korean, 
Um, we, he had already been through uh, Shrek Forever After, and we were very familiar with all the 3D techniques. And between us, we just wanted to make a proper, full volume, no nonsense 3D movie. And that really meant that we were going to use more depth than we had used before. Actually, it's about 20% more overall depth budget, closer or further from previous movies. The lens palette was a little bit longer, which actually um, helps when we're using that much depth. I say longer, we found our sweet spot to be like a 30 to 35 millimeter lens on a super 35 millimeter film back equivalent. And using a far shift, if people want the pixel numbers of 35 pixels, so one and three quarter percent. Uh, so a pretty big depth budget. And um, the movie also cut a little bit slower. So that helped uh, use that much depth as well. So I think to bear that in mind when you look at this eight minute section of the crudes that uh, look out for that uh, good depth budget. Looking at that, I just wanted to ask you a little bit more about the sure. depth issue. And yeah. do you think people working in 3D are using enough, enough depth? How the depth issues between animation and live action that you're seeing? Yeah. And how far you want to push it? I mean, I think there's no uh, reason why animation or live action need to be different mm. in terms of depth choices. I mean, I've really come around to the conclusion, and we've heard it in earlier talks today, that if an audience has to pay more, and if they have to wear glasses, which is generally seen as a negative, mm. then if you're not going to make enough difference with the 3D version compared to the 2D version, then why bother? So forget all artistic reasoning for a minute. Is it different enough <laughs> to make it worth all the extra effort and effort on the audience's part as well? So really, that's uh, criteria number one for me at the moment, that it has to be different enough to be worth it. Mm. And so. Uh, I mean, the audience will decide if the 3D is acceptable or not. So far, I think that using that amount of depth has, has been totally fine for everyone who's seen it. No complaints yet, right. but I don't know. Anyone uh, find it too much? I'm sure some people, maybe. You're all 3D nerds, that's why. <laughs> what about normal people? Any normal people <laughs> in the audience? There's not a normal here. person. Yeah. <laughs> Was it too much? Oh, great. It's great for normal people, too. Okay. You represent all normal people. <laughs> Uh, we found it fine. I think, in actual fact, what causes a lot of stress in 3D is not so much the total depth, but how it's handled from shot to shot and jumping and, around. Okay. And so a lot of lens changes in live action contribute to that shot to shot stress. And um, in animation, of course, we're very spoiled that we can use wide lenses and still get the camera right in the actor's face <laughs> to get the composition mm. that we want. It is more challenging in live action to, to do that. And with the new film, are you pushing it even further on depth? Uh, Turbo, we'll, we have a clip to show of Turbo at the end, which is um, some sections are even more. We've broken it up a little bit. So Turbo, our racing snail movie, we have, <laughs> we have uh, uh, taken the idea of if you're on the track, it's really aggressive. If you're in the pit lane, it's more like normal. If you're up in the stands or in the okay. reporter's booth, it's, it's less. So we're going for a little more contrast in that movie. We'll, we'll take a look at that at the end. So we've got a whole ton of clips. Okay. What yes. would you what, like what, to see next? What's next? Here are the choices. <laughs> we could vote. We put together a 10 minute sort of production workflow type of uh, selection after um, Monsters vs. Aliens. So if people want to know nuts and bolts type of stuff, um, that's pretty good. Otherwise, we just have like How to Train Your Dragon, Puss in Boots, uh, Kung Fu Panda clips from the movie. So does anybody want to know nuts and bolts stuff? I think yeah, we better play the SIGGRAPH one. You can't do a blend at the end of a shot because your brain has already got used to that space. And if it suddenly moves to match the next shot, you feel it move. But at the point that the shot cuts, your brain is kind of reestablishing the next space. And that's the time when you can adjust the second, you know, the incoming shot to move into position. So hopefully, that's something that can be done, whether it's live action or animation in post-production. You just need a little bit of wiggle room in your frame to be able to reconverge in post. And how has 3D animation changed since the days of Chicken Little? Has it just well. keep growing by leaps <laughs> and bounds? Or have you, is there a plateau that's now hit? I think, um, I mean, so for me personally, where we've got to in DreamWorks, 
for monsters versus aliens, I would say it was such a manual process. We were setting interaxial and convergence point, very much like live action is. And um, it took many iterations with the artists, you know, in dailies and notes and me jumping in and just doing many of the shots myself. And over the, the many productions, we've refined that process and I've developed tools that allow automatic measurement within the scene, because of course in the CG world, everything's there to be measured. And um, it's actually gone full circle with Turbo in that about 60 to 70% of setting stereo has been creatively driven, but automatically performed by the software okay. measuring and setting stereo. To the point that actually on Turbo, I've actually set every shot myself, which is unheard of. Okay. So, uh, and this is software that is only at DreamWorks? This yes, is it's not running okay. inside DreamWorks. It runs in Maya, so technically it could be. It could be. <laughs> <laughs> but it's software which is, um, it's really a big database of all the work that we've done in the past summarized into a big database that depending on a distance and the lens choice, it can pull that information and apply it across a shot. But, so that's pretty exciting. Now we're very spoilt in CG, mm. but I could see that that kind of information could go into you know, what they call a sit box on a live action mm. set where if you're rehearsing the shot, you could go, okay, here's position number one, you know, measure by some way, send it to the sit box, it calculates, okay, mark this, you know, save position number one, go to mark number two or whatever, okay, save that. Now you have a slider that's position one, position two, but it would still be helped by that kind of, uh, it would certainly speed up you know, efficiency and live action, sorry, live sports events could okay. potentially be helped a lot from that type of work, I think. And does Turbo feel like a step forward from the crudes? To you, I they? think they're stepped sideways now mm, okay. because I think we have proven that we can make very good 3D, which is comfortable to watch and practically perfect from a left-right comparison. Mm. You know, we don't have real optics to deal with. We don't have any kind of distortion. Every pixel lines up, so we don't have any, any excuse for errors. Mm -hmm. So um, it's now more a case of you know, how do you want to paint? You know, mm. so. That's the exciting bit. Okay. And what do you think we're going to see in the next few years? A lot of change? More steps sideways? I think, um, in, I think in animation it's been, it's been leading the way in terms of technical ability because it's relatively easy to produce good stereo within mm. that environment. So I think between conversion and live action, that's where we're going to see the biggest change. And I hope it's uh, for a greater depth budget and mm. you know, uh, as directors get less scared. Mm. <laughs> and more familiar with what it can do. I'd like to see just greater depth budgets in uh, all the movies. Right. Seems to be a, yeah. a theme that people yeah. have been talking about here. Are you drawn to trying live action 3D? Have you done any of that recently? Uh, only, well, I shoot my own little 3D <laughs> GoPro quadcopter movies yeah. <laughs> flying around the park. Uh, <laughs> PC 3DM, if you want to go and look on YouTube, you can find my little Stuff. So that's, that's like my fun hobby now. Okay. Certainly the challenge of live action. I ended up uh, doing a little bit of uh, work with Ang Lee on Life of Pi okay. just as a uh, sort of a favor through DreamWorks, but it was interesting to see that whole side of things. My, my first reaction was it's just a horror show of how difficult it is <laughs> compared to our world. So I, I have uh, sympathy for everyone out there, but certainly I'm interested to have a go and uh, just see how, how difficult it might be. Right. <laughs> and did you want to show more clips or turbo? Yes, let's yet, see. How are we doing for time? Another 10 minutes? OK, I'll give you a choice. Well, we have to play turbo. That's, that's not a choice. <laughs> I think we should at least play the dragon clip. So How to Train Your Dragon was important because Monsters vs. Aliens was about how do you make stereo at all. You know, we were setting up projectors, setting up the software, all that type of thing. So it was like, how do you actually do it? How to Train Your Dragon was significant and has been recognized for the use of 3D to support the story. So let's go ahead and play um, the dragon sequence, which is uh, scope again, and it's sequence 600. That sequence was important for us because um, at the time, uh, Chris Saunders and Dean Deblois, the two directors, um, 
they were anxious about what 3D was going to do to their movie, <laughs> frankly. We were still in that mode. And we'd kind of been issued instruction that they didn't want anything in front of the screen. They didn't want anything gimmicky. And, um, but we knew, my, I say we, myself and Gil Zimmerman, who was the head of layout on that show, we knew we had ideas that, that we wanted to do this type of thing. So it came down to showing two versions. OK, this is what you asked for. We made it literally, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, a little bit flatter. Everything was very contained. And then we had this version, which was you know, the emotional story-based version. And we explained what we were trying to achieve. And although they didn't technically understand necessarily what we were doing, they looked at both versions. They just went, oh, whatever that one was, do that. Mm. And that was really important for them to understand that what we were trying to do with stereo was totally in support of what they were trying to do. It wasn't with ruining the story. their film. It was <laughs> adding. <laughs> Imagine that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we got past that point pretty early, and we had the freedom to uh, do good work, mm -hmm. I think. Great. And it's a struggle for um, a lot of productions, hmm. getting past that point with um, the director or DP if they're not necessarily on board. And a lot of the big Hollywood productions, it's coming mm -hmm. from the studio to make your movie 3D. And a lot of the time, the productions from the creative side uh, have had it kind of forced on them. Mm. They're not necessarily engaged in the way that could make it the best it could be. Right. But uh, we're lucky because Jeffrey Katzenberg, the boss of the studio, mm. tells the directors what he wants. <laughs> so it's like the old studio system with the benevolent uh, dictator. You know. Yes, a good dictator. Yeah. yeah. Uh, maybe we should go ahead and show some of the turbo yeah. footage because I don't want to run out of time. And Okay. Like we've got to see it, right? It's we have to see Turbo. The first time anybody's seeing this in public. So Turbo <laughs> is a uh, <laughs> racing snail, as I said. Uh, and we're going to see a couple of sequences from early in the movie where uh, he's, he's always been dreaming of more speed. But uh, this is the, um, the transformation sequence where he gets exposed to the powers that will you know, give him that super speed. That's out in July? Uh, that will be out somewhere around July. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we probably have time for a quick question or two. So does anybody have a question for Captain 3D? Mm -hmm. um, is there a microphone down. coming to this fourth row? So Turbo, those shots are like 95% finished. There's a few little bits we're still painting out. But uh, we do these previews where we have to show Jeffrey, yes. the boss, you know, what's the latest. And his response, it doesn't matter what we do, it's always like, it's looking good, guys. I need 50% more 3D. Like every time, it doesn't matter what we do. <laughs> this time he just went, wow, <laughs> for that sequence. So, I think you might need to turn a few of those down. <laughs> so, it's a good response. So, question? Hi there. Um, I'm uh, from Park Road Post in New Zealand. Um, I'm the lead stereographer on The Hobbit. And I've got a couple of HFR questions for you. Yeah. Um, first one is, the large depth budget that was used, you know, that you've shown on Crudes and uh, and Turbo here, do you think HFR would actually help that um, and add anything more to the experience? I think, you know, it, higher frame rates generally help with the motion. Yeah. So, you know, slower shots, it, it doesn't make a big difference to, but mm -hmm. as the motion increases, yeah. we certainly have a more difficult time seeing it. So whether it would necessarily allow you to use more depth or not, I'm not sure, but I think whether it helps you see the picture more or not, I think it does. Yeah. It's the difficulty being then that you also see more of the details you don't want to see more as well. Sure, so yeah, it's like yeah. you know, filmmaking has to get better to match the ability of a uh, higher frame rate. Yeah. And uh, it's pretty scary for us to think we, we'd actually have to render yeah. <laughs> twice or three times as many frames. Have, have you guys done any uh, tests? We haven't done any tests. You know, we had the discussion after we saw the James Cameron tests originally. Yep. And uh, the message back to the boss again. To Jeffrey. To Jeffrey. <laughs> was, uh, I think we let live action fight this fight. Yeah. Because uh, we kind of fought the fight early on for stereo itself. As, yep. Well, he certainly did. And... Um, this is an, a very expensive one for us to no, fight, yeah. and live action can probably fight that better. That's true. And I've, I've got another one, actually. Um, just on cut cushioning, um, on The Hobbit, I did use handoffs or depth transitions at the end of a shot sometimes because yeah. it was live action. What's your take on that? 
uh, I think because obviously that's different to... I basically do three types of cut cushioning, as you say, or yeah. blending, as I call it. You either just have a, you know, shot one, shot two, shot three, and yeah. you just move this one closer to the other two. Yeah, yeah. That's the most basic. The next one would be shot one, shot three, and shot two does this kind of bridge across, which is like a very linear adjustment yeah. to line up. And the other one is, you know, shot one's a long shot here, shot two's a long shot here, yeah. and it's like, as I was saying, you cut in and move forwards, yeah. and then hold it there. Moving at the end, I've pretty much given up on it, okay. unless there's some kind of action which covers the, the moment. Yeah, so if you've exactly. been looking at someone, and yeah. then they turn around and run past camera, you can definitely hide it in that. If it's a very slow drift type of transition, yeah. um, like maybe only moving one pixel every four frames or three frames or something, yeah. you can definitely do that. If it's a quick transition, I tend to always see it and I've avoided doing that. Okay, so you just let it sort of happen and then yeah. try and drift it. If you see it, it's wrong. If you don't see it, it's right. Fair enough, that's <laughs> true. Cool, thank you. Okay, uh, I've been told, I'm afraid we're out of time for more questions, but hopefully oh. Phil will be around. I will just sit here. Okay, um, you could protest yeah. and just have a sit-in <laughs> Q&A. Uh, but, uh, Thank you very much for your insight and that amazing work. Thanks, guys.